Okay, why don't we get started? So, um, the, this course is mostly going to be about the theory of uh, how companies, or what economists call firms, behave. And um, basically, a firm or a company is a sort of group of physical assets, uh, people, and technology, which uh, we tr typically treat as sort of a coherent, profit-maximizing individual, and that's the way we're going to uh, analyze it throughout most of the course. Um, and we'll pretty rarely in the rest of the course sort of look inside of the black box of the firm to actually think about how it is that firms come to maximize profit or whether they actually do a very good job of achieving that goal. Um, and so I want to sort of start off the course by spending a little bit of time looking inside of companies and thinking about how they're structured and uh, whether they actually accomplish uh, the goals that we assume that they try to accomplish. Um, and uh, we'll sort of go through some of the basic questions, which I think will be useful things to have in the back of your mind later, such as what are firms as uh, legal entities? What should firms maximize and what do they in fact maximize? Uh, how do conflicts within firms inhibit their ability uh, to maximize profits? Um, how can they be governed uh, and financed in order to try to limit some of these conflicts? Uh, why do firms exist in the first place? Why can't everything happen through exchange in the marketplace? Um, and I'll talk about some theories of answers to that question, as well as uh, some reasons why that might not be such a great question, actually, in the first place. So, um, firms uh, in most developed countries come in six basic varieties though there's uh, variations on these. So the first is called the sole proprietorship. And this is, uh, you know, what you typically think of as a mom and pop store. Uh, you know, uh, probably Z and H uh, is a sole proprietorship. Uh, as well as many of the franchises of large national chains. So many McDonald's are actually sole proprietorship, even though they're part of, of they seem to be part of a large corporation. They're actually owned by an individual uh, who runs that McDonald's store. Um, and basically, a sole proprietorship is just an extension of an individual. So it's really nothing other than a person uh, just selling and uh, buying stuff for themselves. Um, a partnership is sort of one step of remove from that which is when a group of individuals get together and say they're going to have a business together, then they all assume liability for anything that's done by them as a group. So partnerships have unlimited liability. That means that if they take on a debt as a group, then the people who've led to them, if they don't pay the money back, can go after any of the people to try to recover that debt. And if the company as a whole does something illegal, all of them are legally responsible. Um, and the partnerships are most typically uh, used for professional services, such as lawyers, accountants, uh, and other um, professional groups. Doctors are sometimes uh, in partnership. Uh, the next level of sort of corporatization is a privately held corporation. Uh, and I'll talk more about corporations on the next slide, but the key difference between a private and a public corporation is a private corporation is held by a very small number of people, and there's no public price at which the shares of the company trade. It's just owned by a small number of people who may engage in transactions with one another or other potential buyers, uh, but, but in a very private way. Um, then, what sort of will be our default assumption about what the companies we think about in the course are is publicly held corporations. So a publicly held corporation trades on the stock market. It's any of the you know, big name companies that you think of, that you hear about on the news. Um, there, then there's not-for-profit uh, corporations and something that's related but not the same, which is a cooperative. Cooperative is owned by the people who uh, are customers or workers of the company, rather than being owned by the public, but it does have uh, shares. Um, and not-for-profits 
are tax exempt, but as a result can't disperse profits. So any money inside the company cannot go out to pay for uh, remuneration for someone who's given money to the company. So anyone who gives the money to the company loses that money, basically. And they're very highly regulated. Cooperatives can disperse the profits that they make, but they can only do so to people who are customers or workers for the company. Um, and finally, and this is uh, decreasingly common in advanced countries, but there are government-owned uh, uh, enterprises as well. I guess it was decreasingly common until very recently because uh, you know, during the financial crisis, a number of banks and some uh, industrial firms were nationalized by governments to keep them solvent. What is OECD? OECD, sorry. OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it's a shorthand for a, a rich country. So the OECD countries include all the countries in Europe, uh, the U.S., um, and uh, Japan, uh, and a few other wealthy Asian countries. I think Korea is now in the OECD. Um, okay, so we're primarily going to focus on corporations in this course, so I just want to uh, do a little bit more of background on, you know, what's the nature of a corporation. Um, so, uh, Matt Green. Matt C. Green? Oh, yeah. yeah, hey. Um, what are the defining uh, legal features that make something a corporation rather than any of those other things that I said? Do you know? Um, you know just like a lot of ways, the size or like who is, who is owning and who is contributing to the company. Um, well, so the, the, key, the key feature of a corporation as compared to a partnership is that corporations, unlike partnerships, are individuals separate from the people who are the partners. Um, that is, the, the corporation is, for all basic legal purposes, a person. And just like a person, a corporation can declare bankruptcy. Uh, you know, a partnership can't declare bankruptcy. If they don't pay their debts, you can go after any of the people. Just like they, you know, if I, if you made a loan to me, you could come after me. But if you made a loan to my corporation, you couldn't come after me, because the corporation is a person separate from me. And and they have the rights of individuals, and they have some of the responsibilities of individuals. They're chartered by the states, and they have this limited liability uh, property, which is that only the money that's inside the corporation can be taken by people who've lent money to the corporation. That's sort of the key defining feature of a corporation as compared to <coughs> other forms of organization we've talked about. Um, and uh, also, if the company does bad things and it gets sued, only the money inside the company can be held responsible for that. The, the, the owners have no responsibility for the misdeeds of the company. <coughs> um, and sort of as a, the cost of having maybe what you could call a benefit of limited liability is that corporations have to pay a corporation income tax, which partnerships don't have to pay. So they have to pay a special income tax as corporations, and then if they send something out as dividends or they give money, then you have to pay taxes again on that. So some people say corporations are double tax, whereas if you own a business yourself, you just pay income tax on the money that you get, right? Yeah. Why are um, corporations chartered by states and not the federal government? It's an old tradition. It goes back actually to the you know British rule when the states were. In, so I, I don't I um I don't know if there I don't think there are any corporations that are chartered, chartered by the federal government. It's actually a problem because you know the states have a big incentive to compete for the corporations and they'll try to you know have less and less regulations to get the corporations chartered in their state. So Delaware is infamous for this. So all credit card companies are based in Delaware, basically, because basically Delaware lets you do whatever you want to consumers, charge you whatever, charge them whatever interest rates you want to charge them, use whatever deceptive, you know, terms you want in your credit card stuff. So they want all the business from the credit card companies in their, in their state. Um, so, uh, uh, Cody, do you know what are the two main ways that corporations finance themselves? Get money to. Stocks. Absolutely. That's what we'll call equity. That's right. <coughs> and what's the other way? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Like yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the, so the two ways are, as Cody said, um, as Cody said, uh, there's equity, which is, well, first let me go through debt. So there's, debt comes in two forms, bonds and bank loans. So a bank can make a loan to you, uh, and you make a promise to repay that loan, and a major benefit of uh, taking out a loan is you can deduct from your corporation income tax the interest that you pay on that loan. And that greatly reduces the cost of being financed by debt. Um, and basically what debt is, is the corporation co promises to pay back a certain amount of money, and if it doesn't uh, default on that, that's it, right? But if it does default, the um, bank can come in and can seize whatever uh, the company owns. But not more than that because it is limited liability, right? And because banks are very afraid of getting their money uh, like wasted or the company taking too much risks and it might wipe them out, they tend to put in what are called restrictive covenants, which are all sorts of restrictions on what the company is allowed to do as long as it has this loan from the bank until it pays back the money. Um, and uh, rather than getting a loan from a bank, especially if you're a big corporation, what you could do is you could do what's called float <coughs> bonds which means that you basically uh, give out these pieces of paper that are IOUs, right, and you sell them off to members of the public, just like you would in an open market with stocks or something like that. And so many companies, rather than going to a bank, which might be more expensive, if they're a large company, might float uh, bonds to the public because that allows you to access a much broader pool of capital from the public rather than just uh, the money that any particular bank has to lend. Um, now, uh, the second form, which Cody pointed out, is equity, or, or stocks, uh, which has the tax disadvantage that you can't deduct from your income any profits that you pay out to the stockholders, <coughs> unlike the interest that you pay out to the bondholders. Um, and the way that stock works is you get money from someone in exchange for shares in the company. And a share means you're entitled to the dividends of the company, that is, any profits that it pays out in the future. You're entitled to voting rights in the company, and I'll talk more about the sort of things that you vote on, but basically it's stuff like who gets elected to the corporate board, and you know whether the company merges with another company, for example. And, uh, and you choose the, the board of directors by that voting. And the board of directors are a group of people who have the responsibility of looking out for the interests of the people who uh, own the shares of the company. Yeah? Um, so do you prefer shares have like voting rights? Uh, often not. <clears throat> it's complicated. So preferred shares, that's a good question. Uh, Edward. 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 Um, yeah, so preferred shares are a bit different than common shares, and they're actually not very common. So. The, the number of companies that have a significant number of preferred shares is quite small. So in most cases, we can just sort of ignore that. But I think the best way to think about it in the cases when it does exist is it's sort of halfway between debt and equity. It has a little bit more control rights than debt does, a little bit less covenants than debt does, a little bit less voting rights than equity does, etc. Um, and, yeah, so that's what I, that was the third thing I was going to say. So there's, there's other methods which are between debt and equity, including preferred shares and what are called convertible debt, which is a new thing that they're doing for these financial companies, where it's debt, but then if the company really starts to get into trouble, you can be sort of first to turn it into equity. Yeah? What's a preferred share? Um, good question. Yeah, it's something that's halfway between debt and equity, basically. I mean, the exact terms of preferred shares are complicated. Usually it means that, like, if the company starts to go bust, you, like, all the other equity holders might get wiped out, and then you might still be able to get something, even though you can't get as much as the debt holders can get. So you sort of have some debt claim on the company if it starts to go bankrupt, but you don't, but you you also don't like just get paid back a fixed amount. It depends on how well the company is doing. So. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, during most of this course, we're going to assume that firms maximize profits, as I mentioned. 
Um, but a natural question is whether this is either what firms should do or what they, in fact, do in the real world. Um, and for the moment, let's assume that the owners of the company, the shareholders, actually want them to be doing this. And I'll talk about whether that's the case or not in a moment. Um, but uh, notice that you know, one reason why the shareholders may want them to maximize profit, even if the shareholder has you know, a whole set of goals on his own, is that those profits get paid back to the shareholder. And once the shareholder gets that money back, he can do with it whatever he wants. He can give it to charity. He can use it to buy a new house. You know, whatever purpose he has, uh, he can spend the profits that the company makes on it. So the question is, should managers uh, try to accomplish this goal? Um, and the advocates of so-called corporate social responsibility uh, say the answer is no. They say that it's the responsibility of companies to worry about things like poverty, the externalities caused by the company, uh, and other broader social goals, and that uh, they shouldn't just focus on maximizing profit. So Milton Friedman in the article that you had to read uh, pretty forcefully argues against uh, this view. Uh, Christine, uh, could you tell me why Friedman thinks is, is skeptical of corporate social responsibility? Uh, he tends to think that it should be only the individuals uh, who own the corporation who should be um, donating to charitable causes, causes yeah. uh, because the because he's saying if a CEO tends to make the decision about whether to make donations and where, it's kind of a tax on the shareholders' money. Yeah. And it's not necessarily an efficient one. <coughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think that that's, uh, that's absolutely right. And um, so just to flesh that out a little bit more, his view is basically that managers are like, you know, a machine that is controlled by the owner. And that it's not the job of the machine to correct the machine operator in terms of what you know it uh, it should do with the machine. Basically, managers' go, you know um, uh, purpose is to figure out how is the best way to achieve what the shareholders want to achieve, rather than to choose the goals. And that basically, by pursuing the goals, the managers are basically imposing a tax or stealing from the shareholders, right? And um, you know. If the company is creating externalities, that's the job of the government to fix it, not the job of uh, the manager to unilaterally decide you know, what externalities exist or not. Yeah? Remind me of your name, David Hampton. David, David Hampton, yeah. Um, what I don't quite understand, I guess, I was arguing, he seems to really focus on ownership. Like His big problem is that it's, it's not the manager's money um, yeah. to be doing things. But like in the, in the case of an externality, isn't that inflicting a cost on somebody else? So in a way, you're making them spend money. So like, yeah. you're, you're inflicting a cost upon them. It's, it, it seems like more or less the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think there's definitely um, <coughs> counter arguments to be made against this, but I think the basic problem is that, look, imagine that there's some uh, awful polluter who's doing lots of terrible, you know, dumping tons of toxic waste into the river. Would you think it would be a very good idea for like some vigilante to come along, decide that this guy was imposing an externality, even though the government hadn't done anything about it, and like steal a bunch of money from this guy or blow up his factory? Probably not. And the reason is because you know we think that you start allowing stuff like that and things degenerate into chaos. That like it's not really his social role to like decide whether that's what's going on or not, uh, and so forth. And in some sense. I think you know exactly what Christine was articulating is that um, that's exactly what a manager does when he doesn't uh, maximize the profits for his shareholders because really you know he was hired for a particular purpose right uh, now it may be that we should tax the shareholders or that we should you know <coughs> uh, throw them in jail or there's lots of things we might want to do but the idea that it would be the job of the manager to figure to decide that uh, it seems a little bit uh, um, inappropriate. And similarly, if the shareholders, you know, want to pursue a goal like that, why don't they just take the profits that they get out and, you know, use those profits to do uh, what they want? Um, so, you know, basically, unless it's helping the firm sell to consumers, and I think that's a lot of why companies do social, corporate social responsibility, is that they think people will like their product if they think that they're socially responsible. 
Uh, and in fact, sometimes companies can get that without even doing anything socially responsible just by looking cool. So like Apple, everyone, if you take a survey of people of how corporate social responsibility, what companies they think are best on corporate social responsibility, everyone puts like Apple near the top. Because Apple's so cool, it must, it must be doing lots of corporate social responsibility stuff. But in reality, they don't do anything. So it's just, it's just completely false. Um, anyway, so most economists are pretty sympathetic uh, to Friedman's perspective um, because they accept in the cases when an executive has a social goal and is willing to accept less pay from the company in exchange for being able to pursue his social goal, in which case he's really spending his own money rather than the company's money. Right. Okay. So some have made a more modest sort of corporate social responsibility claim, not that um, you know, managers should just deal with externalities or social goals or sort of broader things, but just that they should try to help sort of the direct stakeholders of the firm. So people like workers or consumers. And in fact, this is exactly what the idea of a cooperative is, right? If you're owned partially by your consumers and your workers, you're going to look out for their interests and not just the interests of shareholders. Yeah? Isn't that, like, just by saying something like, saying that like that they should look out for workers and consumers assumes that the company isn't doing that. And you wouldn't, like, you, like, it seems like a rational profit <coughs> tax mining firm would want to look out for the consumers because that means the consumers will return. So it's in their interest to have it. What, what's your name? Ben Jacobson. Ben. Or the workers, like, you want happy workers because that means they'll be better. Profit maximizer. So like yeah. th that, that, like that statement to me. Well, that, like that's rather. true. I mean, we'll see in this course though <clears throat> that there are definitely ways in which the firm doesn't just will do things that won't be fully in the interest of consumers. Sure. And so you might think that they should do things that are more in the interest of consumers than just their profit motive would give them an incentive. But then the freedom of just argue right that like well then the government law about that and like it should be the responsibility of the firm. Yeah, I mean, so so I think that there's more to the stakeholder society view than there is to like the broad externality view. And, and in fact, it works quite well in cooperatives. I think there is some real evidence that cooperatives work better in the interests of consumers, at least in some cases, than do standard corporations. So I, I think there's some case for that. But I think even this, most economists, uh, or at least many economists, are skeptical of. Because I think they would argue that the basic problem is there's a fundamental difference you know, if you think of a company as being like, you know, something that a bunch of people make together that is good for all of them, one component is the workers, one component is the people who fund the company, and one component is the people who consume, right? And there's a basic difference between the people who fund it and the people who work or consume, which is that if I stop liking Pepsi, I don't have to drink Pepsi anymore. If I don't like working at a Pepsi factory, you know, hopefully if the economy is not as bad as it is now, I can find a job somewhere else, right? Uh, whereas the sh shareholders, once they've given their money to Pepsi, like, who cares about them, right? I mean, the money is now in the other person's hand. They might as well run off with it and, you know, do whatever they like unless there's some legal or ethical restrictions which get the company to look out for the interests of the shareholders. The shareholders are going to be, you know, just completely screwed, right? Um, and, and what that means uh, is not just, you know, it might be a good idea to steal from people who are shareholders. They might be too rich and we might want to redistribute wealth from them. And we'll talk about redistribution later. But the problem is that if you do it through the corporation not looking out for their interests, no one's going to give their money to companies. And then you're not going to get the company starting up and then no one's going to be employed and no one's going to be able to buy <coughs> products, right? So if you undermine the ability of shareholders to recover their money, you really undermine the ability of the whole economic system to work. You can certainly pursue some of these other goals you have in other ways, but in the same way that if you let people commit all sorts of crime, rather than you know, having the government redistribute wealth, you know, people would be hiding all their stuff and you, know, you would have chaos. And similarly, you wouldn't really have a functioning investment system if you didn't have strong legal and ethical protections for shareholders, because people just wouldn't give their money to companies. And we'll talk about what happens when people don't give their money to companies in a, in a few, uh, few slides. <coughs> so um, I think this leads most economists to believe that the primary goal of corporate governance should be to protect the value uh, or profit of shareholders. So the problem, though, is what the heck does profit even mean, right? So uh, a naive definition of profits is just the you know amount that I sell times the price I sell it for minus cost. 
But in most you know, real world settings, this is a completely meaningless quantity, even though we're going to use it in, our, in the course a lot. Because um, for a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, there's a basic difference between economic and accounting profits. Uh, Julie Dorkin? Julie, can you give an example of a uh, difference between economic and accounting profits? Well, in economic profits, there's more the concern of opportunity costs. So say I were to work for Starbucks. If, like, devoting my time there, I'd give up the opportunity cost of money spent working elsewhere. Or money I could have gained working for someone else. Yeah, that's right. So if you ran a Starbucks franchise yourself, right? Uh, you shouldn't count as part of your economic profit, even though you would count as part of your accounting profit, the upper, you know, the labor that you put into the firm, basically, right? And how much you could have made if you were working some other job rather than running the Starbucks. That's exactly right. Um, so that's that's one issue. Another manifestation of that is that you know, a larger company is always going to be generating more profits unless it's totally incompetent, right? But uh, that doesn't mean that just by getting larger, a company uh, is actually doing better, right? Because imagine that I have, you know, currently 100 shareholders, right? And now I'm going to increase my number of shareholders 10 times, right? Float a bunch of shares, get a bunch more money, and invest that. And now my, you know, profits go up. So my profit per original shareholder might well go down as a result of that, right? And so the original shareholders don't want you to do that. So the real thing that matters is how maximizing the profit per current shareholder and not the total amount of profits that the company is generating. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. A second problem arises from the fact that you know, companies do things over time. Right? They don't just like make all their decisions and get all their profits at one day. And, um, Profits in the future are not worth as much as profits today are worth. Because profits today can be invested, and you can make a, a return on those, right? So you should be discounting the profits in the future. But on the other hand, you shouldn't either only care about today's <coughs> profits and completely forget about the future. So there's this delicate balancing act of how you discount uh, uh, future profits to both put some value on time, but also not to be too short-termist. A third problem is uncertainty. So you may not know what's going to uh, maximize profits. And if you're uncertain, um, the only thing you can do is maximize expected profits. But even that doesn't make very much sense. Because first of all, people may disagree on what they expect uh, the consequences of various different things the firm does to be. Second, people care about risk as well. If the company is taking a ton of risk, even if its expected profits are high, that might not be a, a very good course of action. And different people might have different attitudes towards the types of risks the company takes. Yeah, what, what's your name? Uh, my name is Andy, but it will say send it all on my Okay. Terms. Yeah? Wait, wait, what's your question? Well, I was just going to say, doesn't, doesn't this um, sort of bring in the ideas brought in or brought in the, the next article? Uh, what was his name? Coase? Yeah. Yeah, because he mentions about uncertainty bringing uh, two problems, and one of which is um, entrepreneurs can only forecast uh, the demands and sort of set their production up to that. But then also the market can uh, drive like technology and all those forecasts by itself. That's why it's burned. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, uncertainty causes tons of problems, and it shows up in tons of places. But one place where it shows up is the effect that it has on what's the right notion of profits for firms to use. So one solution, which I think most companies basically follow, is they try to maximize the stock market value. So this idea is supposed to, supposed to take into account uncertainty, it's supposed to take into account discounted present value, and, and so forth. So uh, Shin, yes. Shin uh, what are some problems with using stock market value as a, as a basis for figuring out what a company is worth? Because in the stock market today, the investors aren't just looking at um, the discounted future stream of cash flow, yeah. but actually like um, market volatility and um, many other macroeconomic factors. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these, um, you know, don't have a stock market value. They're not floated on the stock market. But probably more importantly is what you mentioned, which is that you know the stock market. It's totally nuts. I mean, I think anyone who's been following it for the last few years knows that it goes all over.
over the place, and it reflects a lot more than sort of a rationally expected discounted present value, because, you know, people are speculating on what other people are going to think, and I mean, there's a million different things going on, right? So, stock market value doesn't seem, you know, represent a really good measure of long-term value either. Um, so, I think that, you know, these are really important things to keep in mind. For most of the rest of the course, we're going to completely ignore these issues and assume that profits are just really <coughs> simple and well-defined. Because I think that for a lot of the purposes we're considering, like how much quantity the firm produces and so forth, they're not really that relevant. But they're, they're good things to keep in mind and to constantly be thinking, do, do these things matter for the type of questions we're going to be thinking about? Um, okay, so uh, another problem is whether shareholders agree on the goals for the firm, on the notion of profits. So one, one reason they might disagree is that some shareholders want to maximize profit, others have other goals, like you know, corporate social responsibility, or you know, corporate social responsibility sounds nice, right? But there's also nasty things that uh, the shareholders might like. So for example, they might not like uh, black people, and they might not want the firm to employ any black people, or sell to black people, right? And uh, that was actually a real problem during the 50s, is that there were fights in boardrooms over you know, what should be their policy towards segregation and, and things like this. So uh, it's not just for good causes, but also for bad causes, that they might diverge from the goal of maximizing profits. So um, a common response, as I was talking about earlier, is you know the company should try to make as much profits as possible, and people can go and spend their money on, on whatever they want to spend it on. Now, um, an, a, perhaps, more serious problem is that different uh, shareholders may have different perspectives on risk, both because they have different aversion to risk, but also because, you know, if I'm a um, steel worker and all my income depends on how the steel industry is doing, I probably don't want a company I'm investing in to make an investment in steel, right? Because that is going to be, that's going to uh, be correlated with the income that I make off of my job, and therefore uh, it's going to make my whole set of investments riskier. Yeah? Um, what about stuff like if you want, like you have an interest, I'm just thinking about like corporate raiders and stuff yep. like that, where like you're buying shares, but you want to like liquidate the company, or you want to do something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in just one second, so let, let's wait a second. So um, there could also be different types of shareholders. And one particular, you know, there, there's both the preferred shareholders and the regular shareholders, and they may have different interests. But a particularly uh, big problem is when there is a single large shareholder. So is Sneha here? Sneha? I seen N E H A. Okay. Well, um, can someone tell me what a problem might be with uh, having a large shareholder, uh, one large shareholder? Yeah. Um, the majority shareholder. And you can also have issues with redemptions. Yeah, so what, what would you think is an example of the ma majority shareholders hurting the minority shareholders? Um, their views on the direction of the company or can influence the path of it and shout over the voice of the minority. Yeah, and a particularly extreme case of that is, and in fact this happens a lot in places where there's very poor protections of minority shareholders. So imagine the majority shareholder also owns another company, right? And imagine they have 51% of this company. They could instruct the company to sell all of its assets to the other company for one-tenth of what they're worth, right? And then they lose 50% of the asset value, uh, but they gain all of it in the other company. And this happened all the time in Russia. So what they would do is they would privatize these companies. Someone would buy up 51% of the company. Then they would sell off at basically zero price to another entity all the stuff, and they would just basically just steal everything from the company, right? Um, or a more subtle form of this is another company might own a competitor of this company and might not want them to compete too hard against the competitor. And that would be bad for the shareholders of this company, but it would be good for the uh, other company's profits. Um, and this is why there are strong legal protections in most OECD countries of minority shareholder rights. The types of solutions that we tend to have to these problems, in addition to legal protections of shareholder rights, are one, that, consumer, that shareholders can vote, that doesn't really deal with the majority problem, but at least it helps uh, aggregate together, at least to some extent, the views of the different shareholders. And second, um, as uh, 
as it was Edward, right? Ben. 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 As Ben was mentioning, uh, the um, there's always the possibility that someone can come, a raider can come in and buy out the company, and that sort of forces them to maximize profits. Right. So it, it, in other words, if the company is worth less than what a raider could make it worth, then there's going to be an incentive for a raider to come. And so the company has an incentive to make sure that it doesn't. Uh, you know, reduce profits too much because otherwise there's a possibility of greater coming in. Uh, David? Don't most corporations have um, ways to get around this problem by including super majority vote, voting requirements in their bylaws to approve like mergers or like so, Yeah, so some of those things so that they can adjust voting uh, to, to rules to do that. I mean, all of these problem things you'll realize create problems in other areas. So almost any solution also creates problems. So everything is an issue of trading off all the different problems, as as we'll sort of see as we go forward. But yes, those are the types of uh, solutions that companies try to use. But it's a very difficult problem. So, um, <clears throat> so that is basically what I wanted to say about what companies should be doing. Now there's a the question of what companies actually do. And obviously, not-for-profit corporations uh, don't maximize profits. They're, they're a relatively small part of the economy, but they're growing. Um, but they often, even if they don't maximize profits, do care about how much money they're taking in. So if you look at the Grameen Bank, even though it's not-for-profit, they care a lot about getting repaid on their loans because they want to have that money to make loans in the future. That's a good interpretation. Or they want to have money to pay their managers, which is the less uh, charitable interpretation. But honestly, even not for uh, usually even not for profits care quite a bit about uh, uh, making profit. Basically, uh, there's also cooperatives which partially incorporate consumer and worker value. But again, if the managers of those cooperatives are more concerned with how much they're making than they are with you know the goals of the cooperative, uh, they may come closer to being profit maximizing. State-owned companies are sort of legendarily inefficient and make lots of losses, and so I think it's pretty clear that. It's often not the right way to think of them as profit maximizing. However, it really depends on the management that's put in. Because actually the car companies and the financial companies, which were basically nationalized by the U.S. government uh, you know, uh, in the fall of 2008, um, did a relatively good job of maximizing profits actually, because the leadership that was put into the, in place was really focused on paying back, and that was what the pressure on them was, rather than to do, achieve certain political goals the government had. Um, other shareholder goals may get in the way of things, but I think by far the most important reasons why companies fail to maximize profits is that managers don't really have an incentive to serve the interests of the shareholders uh, faithfully. Um, and this is going to be uh, the, the focus of sort of the next 20 minutes, but before I go there, I just want to say that even when the um, corporation is not serving the interests, of the shareholders. Still, if managers want to have money to waste or spend on things that they like, they have to make that money first, right? And so that can give even companies that aren't really doing a good job of um, serving the interests of their shareholders an incentive to at least how they act in the profit, uh, in the product markets, act somewhat like a profit maximizer, right? So some, many of the things we'll say about profit maximizing companies will be true, even if companies aren't maximizing profits but are just trying to get money for their managers. Okay, so many managers have their own interests, obviously, rather than the company's interests in mind. And then they employ managers who have their own interests and not the company's interests in mind. And then they employ managers who have their, their own interests and the company, not the company's interests in mind. And then eventually you get all the way down to the workers who are also turtles. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know the story about turtles all the way down. But, but basically, it's just a giant stack of people who are each self-interested rather than having the interests of the company in mind. right? Um, and this leads naturally to all sorts of perverse uh, behavior, which we'll talk about in a minute. But sort of the ideal situation would be one in which the person who manages the company is also the person who owns the company. Michael <coughs> Wayne? Why, why, why would that be the ideal situation? Um, because uh, as the owner, you have the biggest thing in the company, so you want less interest in the company. So it's yeah. like, um, well, like an example would be like an entrepreneur. Like yeah. They, they manage the company, but then they're, they also own the company, so they have to perform the best in the company. Yeah, that's, that's exactly 
exactly right. They, they, there's no conflict there. There's no principal agent problem there, right? Um, but the problem is, it's usually very hard to make that happen. And the reason is that you know some people in the economy are talented, good entrepreneurs, can have good ideas, and other people have money. And th unless those are exactly the same people, it's just not going to be possible for the same people to supply the capital as supply the talent that the company needs to succeed, right? Yeah. What, what's your name? Easy. What? What is it? Easy. Easy. Yeah. Uh, so why not always pay in shares? Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> That's going to be the focus of everything that we're going to be talking about now. So, yeah. 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 Given that. Most What's your name again? I'm Terrence. 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 Yeah. Given that for most people, their primary source of income comes from the company they're working for, yep. isn't it there? Isn't it then like large? Isn't it true that then they have a large stake in making sure the company performs, so they get? Well, I mean, think about it. Imagine that I'm employed by some big institution, right? Like, look at me in the University of Chicago. I mean, I, I appreciate that you guys are all sitting here in my class, but I think that the future of the University of Chicago does not depend very heavily on you know, uh, how I do in this class. I think if, even if I completely screwed up this class, the University of Chicago would still be a good university. So uh, I don't think a share in like the overall performance of the University of Chicago would do very much uh, to incentivize me to be a good teacher. I'm being a good teacher for, or I'm trying to be a good teacher for other, for other reasons than, than just the overall performance of the University of Chicago. So when someone has, cares about all of the interests of the company, when, like, when they own the company, that's called them being a residual claimant. And in principle, we can do this even if the person didn't supply the capital, right? I can make you a residual claimant on the value of the University of Chicago if you sort of said, well, you didn't supply the capital, but if the University of Chicago even goes down a little bit, I'm going to like torture you to death, right? Because then you would like bear the full value of the University of Chicago. But the problem is, I don't think any of us would really like a system like that because basically it would be pretty uh, risky uh, to get involved with anything if something completely out of your control that made the University of Chicago do less well led you to be tortured to death, right? Um, so, uh, in, and in countries where there aren't good institutions to solve these types of problems uh, and where there isn't good protection of shareholders, Basically, people can't trust anybody other than someone who's in their family or themselves to manage the company. And that ends up leading to a huge amount of debt and nepotism um, and uh, to old boys networks and really limits meritocracy. Because the only way we can solve this problem that some people have capital and other people have talent is if there's some way that the people of capital can get their capital back from the people who have talent that they give it to, right? Otherwise, you can only give money to people who are in your family because, you know, they'll look out for your interest. And this is a huge, huge problem in developing countries that almost all uh, businesses are family businesses or ones that are run by the person themselves. And this is a main, I think, if not the main reason for underdevelopment in, in poorly developed countries is there aren't the institutions that allow uh, businesses to start by people other than people who currently have money. And that leads to a huge amount of inequality as well. So this is the reason why economists put so much emphasis on protecting shareholders. It's not because uh, we like the shareholders. It's because actually the only way to redistribute wealth to people who currently don't have that much money is to give them the opportunity to borrow from those people who are currently better off. I think we should, I think we should go on, unless you guys have something very important. I have a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. When you say these institutions, do you mean like private equity from a venture capital, or do you mean like the government making sure that people don't get cheated? Government making sure people don't get cheated. But that encourages the private equity, right? Sure. So, yeah. I was just going to ask, isn't it part of the problem because there's no private property laws in underdeveloped countries, so then nobody can use that as um, collateral? I don't really know. So I, I think the answer is basically no. Uh, I mean, I, we could go into a long discussion about that, but what it means that there isn't private property is quite complicated, but I think by far the most important thing is that people who control the most resources have no guarantee that they're going to get it back if they give it to anyone else. And so it just leads to... I mean, I, we could go into a long discussion about that, but what it means that there isn't private property is quite complicated, but I think by far the most important thing is that people who control the most resources have no guarantee that they're going to get it back.
they give it to anyone else. And so it just leads to concentration of wealth in very small hands and the employment of people who are connected with those rich people. So in general, this problem of incentives, the principal agent problem, it's a very general problem that shows up all over economics. And it's something we're going to be discussing throughout the course. So I'm going to go over it pretty briefly and, um, and in pretty informally uh, right now. But, um, but it's something we'll keep coming back to. OK, so the essence of management is the principal agent problem. So when, you know, if you go and get an MBA, really what you're learning to do is to motivate people to get work done, right? And that happens in a lot of different ways. So um, Jeff Bollinger, um, what, uh, can you give me some examples of ways companies motivate people to work? Uh, so I guess in general, sort of surveillance, for lack of a better term. I guess particularly for low-level workers. Surveillance? You yeah, yeah. People. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also, I remember reading about this negative economics, and apparently it doesn't always work too well, but stock options. Yeah. So th those are some good examples. And those are the classic examples, actually, of what economists usually emphasize. So Jeff hit on sort of the first two things on my list. First of all, um, equity and stock options. Uh, stock options is the right to buy a stock at some price, and equity is the actual shares in the company, are a way of incentivizing people to work harder. Um, but uh, there are lots of other ways to incentivize people to work harder, and there's actually a lot of problems with giving them uh, just equity and stock options or other financial instruments. So another way you can do it is you can do what's called vesting or deferred or contingent compensation. That is, we don't give you just equity in the company, but rather than paying you a salary, we put some money into a pool, and we say only if the company doesn't blow up in five years do you get this money. Or only if you know X doesn't happen, or only after a certain period of time will you get this money that we've paid to you. So that's another form of, and 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 one version of this is make, giving the money to the person, but then making them personally liable for things that happen, or having what's called a clawback provision, which is you give them money, but then if something really terrible happens to the company, you can like take the money back from them, right? Um, another way is direct monitoring. Uh, as Jeff mentioned. So you can just directly monitor what people are doing and, and you get mad at them if they uh, don't do it. Give them uh, instructions, watch over them. That's the role that a lot of managers or foremen play uh, at lower level jobs. Um, but then uh, we start to get to, we're going to gradually get to sort of things that economists talk about less, but which play an important role as well, if not a more important role. So one is uh, lawsuits and audits. So if a company's doing something bad, they might get audited or, or their shareholders might bring a lawsuit against them uh, for not doing a good job. Um, another thing that you might do is it, someone might be afraid of losing their job, right? They might really value their job. So that might give you a reason to make the job actually pay really well, even if the person isn't worth it, just to make sure they're really afraid of losing their job so that they won't screw up in any way, right? So that's called the efficiency wage idea. Another thing that you might do is give people bonuses. And those could be based on like actual performance in some measurable way. Or they could just be based on your boss's subjective evaluation of how well you've done on the job. Um, another thing that is very important motivator is people's reputation. Right? They want to get a reputation for being a hard worker so that they'll be hired by other firms. And information about their reputation may flow, and that gives them an incentive to work work harder. Um, another, again, this is getting even softer, but I think these things play a really important role in motivation, is the fact that you know, some companies try to foster a culture or a vision of like, what the company is all about. And they try to create a culture of you know, innovation or, or whatever uh, it is that the company stands for. And this can, if they can sort of drill this into people's minds, people sort of think, what it means to be a professor at the University of Chicago is to be intellectually engaged, right? And, and, and I say, I'm a University of Chicago professor. I really want to be engaged. And that motivates me to go to you know, meetings with my colleagues and so forth, because I internalize that as part of who I am as a human being. And so I think that's actually a, a very important motivator. And especially in the professions, they spend a huge amount of time drilling doctors and other professionals in like, you know, what it is to be a doctor, right? 
And that's a huge motivator, I actually think, for the way that people do their work, to the extent that it succeeds, at least. Um, similarly, a leader at the head of a company can be very important. So someone like Steve Jobs, I think, really inspires the people who work for him. And just by showing them sort of uh, a vision, he's able to get them to work harder because they, they sort of aspire to please him or to, uh, or to follow his leadership and be part of the enterprise that he's engaging in. And that can be positive. That can work through respect, as I think it does for jobs. But it can also work through fear. So if you're just absolutely terrified of your boss, right, even if he's not going to fire you directly, but you're just terrified of him, you can just be afraid and want to work harder so you don't disappoint him. Um, another opposite type of thing, which I think is very important at Google, is sort of this idea that people have intrinsic motivation to do things that they you know, just aspire to do on their own. And those may be good th things for the company. So for example, at Google, one day out of every week you get to just work on some project that's not related to the main thing that you're doing. And I think that you know, Google, people at Google thinks that works really well because it inspires people to be creative. And these are people who they've selected who really want to sort of innovate and so forth. And so that sort of intrinsic motivation can be a very important part of, of a company's uh, development. Another thing that can be important is you know, if you hire people within your family, uh, or if the people at the company are related to one another, they can do it because they want to help out their family. And a very important form of motivation, especially in the military, is the fact that they try to develop very close ties among people. So even if they're not loyal to the cause, even if they don't care whether we win in Iraq, they want to protect their friends. Right? And that leads them to work harder, be, and that leads them you know, to be courageous, because they don't want their friends to die. So that can be a very important form of motivation as well. So again, economists like to sort of, they sort of cut things off here a lot of the time. And they like to think about these hard incentives. But in, in a lot of cases, some of these softer incentives are just as important uh, complementary motivators. OK, so um, what sorts of problems are these incentives used to solve? Well, let me give you some example. One major problem is embezzlement, uh, just stealing from the company, right? And this is actually a lot more common than you might think it is. Um, the, the pri this is the primary reason, actually, why there's security cameras at most uh, you know, convenience stores. It's not because they're afraid of being stolen from, from someone outside. It's that they're afraid of being stolen from by their own uh, workers. Um, and in fact, apparently the main reason why it makes sense for there to be credit cards, someone did a study on this, is how much people at the stores would steal from the cash register there was a bunch of cash just sitting there. Um, so, and this is an even worse problem in developing countries. I mean, it's like, it's the primary problem you have when you have a business is you're afraid that people are just going to steal from you. Um, another problem is, is what economists call shirking, not working hard enough. So this can either be just like blatantly not coming to work or not, you know, trying, but it can also be not really being focused, not thinking about your work, not really being engaged with it, not really being prepared when you come into work to get things done. Um, uh, you can also, there, there's also major problems of taking too much or sometimes too little risk. So um, this is a huge problem for a, bunch, a lot of the Wall Street banks, as we saw during the crisis. And in fact, there was just another blow up uh, at the uh, UBS, which is a big Swiss bank, uh, has this guy who basically went and he was trying to make a bunch of money because he wanted to move up. The, he was very low on the totem pole. He wanted to move up, right? He didn't see that he had much downside to lose because if he lost money on some big trade, the company would pay for it. But if he gained it, he would become famous within the company and he'd move up, right? So his incentives were to take on this huge risk and he sort of blew up his company as a result of that, right? So you can have bad incentives for too much risk taking, but there, you could also have an incentive for too little risk taking. So if the manager is very risk averse, really wants to hold on to the position, if there's someone who's advanced at the company and is really afraid of you know, losing their job if anything goes wrong, they might not want to uh, take any of the risks which might be needed for the company to succeed. Um, and this is a big problem, is companies are constantly choosing how ambitious the projects they take on should be. Another similar problem is companies may be too focused on the short term uh, in some cases. Um, so, uh, other, 
less uh, traditional incentive problems have become uh, of interest to economists recently. One is called empire building. And this is the idea that many managers seek after glory <coughs> or fame or like they want to have a big company and they want to be the president of a really famous company rather than uh, serving the interests of maximizing the profits of their shareholders. And in fact, there is uh, a number of studies that have shown most mergers are actually wasteful and are just an attempt by the manager to get control over more stuff. So, uh, Anthony Song? Yeah, hey, Anthony. Um, what, uh, what incentives of, of that big list of incentives that I gave, which ones do you think might work well or not so well against Empire Building? So that's, that's one approach to take, that's right. I think also, you know, ec giving someone an equity stake can be, a, can be a pretty good way of disincentivizing empire building um, because then they have more of an interest in the profits of the company. But actually a lot of the softer incentives can actually be really bad for empire building. So if you think about, you know, intrinsic motivation or mission, that's exactly what leads someone to want to be an empire builder. If they, if they believe in the mission of the company, that's almost bad, right? Because then they're going to try to, they're like, well, we've got to, you know, uh, take over the whole world. We're the best company ever, right? Rather than just thinking about the profits of their shareholders. Another problem is what economists often call multitasking. And this happens when um, there are some outcomes that are easy to measure and other outcomes that are hard to measure. So my favorite example of this is that in Colombia, the government instituted a program that they would pay, and that they do this in Afghanistan too, that they would pay the military for each um, insurgent that they brought back killed. <laughs> so, of course, what happened is they just started slaughtering people in the countryside and dressing them up as insurgents and like bringing them back for their ransom, right? So if you can't monitor whether you're killing a bad guy or a good guy, right, then it's, this obviously isn't going to work very well, right? And so, um, <laughs> a more common example of this is that often, you know, salespeople uh, can be monitored for how many house loans they give, say, but they can't be monitored for whether the people that they're giving the house loans to are like a crack addict, or whether there's actually a chance that they'll pay back the loan, right? Uh, and um, and so, if you can't monitor that, giving incentives for something like you know selling a lot of loans can actually be, be counterproductive because it leads you to focus so much on what can be measured and not enough on what can't be measured. Um, so, uh, Ben, uh, what do you think, um, what types of incentives do you think would work well to get people to balance things uh, better? Softer incentives tend to work better in these cases where it's hard to measure things, right? When there's important things that can't be measured, something like professionalism in the military, like this, I, like instilling the military in Colombia with the idea that like you protect civilians, you don't hurt civilians, you know, giving them a lot of drills and training and that type of stuff can be a much more effective uh, incentive mechanism than can uh, paying them for doing this when, when there's these unmeasurable things. I think I think we actually have to move on. So I'm sorry about that. Um, a final uh, incentive problem that a lot of people have been talking about recently is what's called overstaying your welcome. So this is a case when managers really want to stay in a job and um, they don't, even if they're not the right person to do it anymore. So this is a big problem that happens in startup companies. So often someone like Mark Zuckerberg will say, I your want welcome. To so this is a case when managers really want to stay in a job and um, they don't, even if they're not the right person to do it anymore. So this is a big problem that happens in startup companies. So often, someone like Mark Zuckerberg will say, I want to be running Facebook. Now, Mark Zuckerberg was not really a businessman. He was really a technology guy, but he wants to be running Facebook. 
And so they have to bring in all these people to like control him and make sure he doesn't destroy the company, basically, uh, because you know he really shouldn't be running it in the first place, right? Um, and so one thing that uh, managers will often do is they'll try to make themselves invaluable by getting involved in a lot of really complicated stuff that no one other than them understands, and so it becomes impossible to fire them because it'll all blow up if they're not around. Um, and Andrew. Well, we should probably move on anyways. So, um, things work really differently for all of these different things. So the right way to give incentives is really that you have to balance which of these problems are most important in any given situation and uh, which, which help do these best. So many, uh, when companies are financed, many of these issues arise. And in fact, the problems that I gave you is going to ask you to think about these things. Um, but let, let's just quickly think about some of the possibilities. So uh, one... Um, one uh, type of financing that a company can have is personal capital. This is just someone puts in their own money. Then you have the advantage that, you know, basically everything works then, right, for the reasons we talked about earlier. But another type of financing is you can get money from friends uh, and family. And this is what uh, companies do at an early stage often. They get loans from their, uh, or, uh, investments from their friends and their family. And the advantages of these are somewhat similar to them putting your own money in. So you really care about your friends and family. You don't want to disappoint them. But on the other hand, um, your friends and family don't have that much money themselves, right? And so it's hard to start a big company that way. So the next stage you usually go to is venture capital. You try to get money from a company which is dedicated to giving money to uh, startups like yours and therefore usually has quite a bit of expertise in your area and can understand what your business is doing and therefore might be able to do a better job of monitoring you. Um, and they often end up replacing the manager. And again, the, some of the advantages of this are because they understand your company, they can probably monitor you better. Uh, you can also probably establish a personal relationship with them, which will lead you to be more intrinsically motivated. But the downside of it is that, um, again, the per private equity probably doesn't have that much money relative to what a public market would or what a bank might have. And so those offer ways to access more money. Uh, one of the ways to access the most money is through public bonds. One problem with public bonds relative to bank loans is that imagine that you start going into bankruptcy. If there's a zillion different people that own your bonds, it's going to be very hard for them to negotiate with you to keep you from going into bankruptcy. Whereas if you have a bank, the bank can keep you from going into bankruptcy by trying to readjust your loan. This was a big problem that arose during the subprime crisis, right? which was that a bunch of banks owned the loans of all these people who had their mortgages. right? And even though it would have been in the interest of all those people to negotiate with them, it was too hard to get all these people who, who owned the loans that had been sold off to negotiate with people to uh, change their own. Um, okay. So, <laughs> given all these problems that show up within organizations, within firms, why should we have companies at all? So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm short on time, so I'm going I'm to sort of power through this. So, um, if you think about a GM assembly plant, right, um, they uh, really don't need to own the assembly plant. For example, what they could do is they could hire one company to put the tires on the car. They could hire another company to paint the car. Uh, they could hire another company, you know, to uh, attach the bolts. And all these things could be, you know, independent other companies that are doing everything to the car. Now, this might seem a bit unrealistic, but if you just think about, I forget what the uh, Reynolds Club, if you think about Reynolds Club, right? There's like a thousand different companies in there, and they're all exterior to the university, but you sort of wouldn't know. They're all offering different bits of food service. So it's not necessarily obvious that you can't subcontract all these different processes, right? Um, and in fact, this is happening for increasing things. So many places outsource their tech support or their IT services or all sorts of different things. So a natural question is, wouldn't it be just more efficient to ship everything outside of the company and buy it from someone else? Um, and the COSA article that I had you read 
pointed out that within firms, things are much more like command and control. They're like a top-down, someone tells someone to do something and so forth. Um, and if economists, as you, you probably have already picked up, tend to believe not in command and control, not in centralized control, but rather in the market system, why don't we just operate everything like that within companies? Um, and these types of questions are usually called the boundaries of the floor, the firm. And during the rest of the lecture, I'm going to try to quickly explore uh, some of these uh, questions. So, Coase was sort of the first person to offer a, a theory of the firm. And basically what he said is that there were some costs of using the market, and there were some costs of, doing, of using uh, things within a company. And that firms chose their uh, size based on the relative cost of doing things within the company and outside the company. So, costs outside the company uh, come from having to negotiate all the terms of contracts, having to enforce the contracts, having to figure out what the prices are, uh, some tax reasons, and so forth. And some of the managerial costs of the firm include that you have to manage all these people, all the principal agent problems that I was talking about. Um, the head manager of the company may only have the capacity to manage so many people, right? <coughs> and so he may get overwhelmed. Um, now, a big problem with Kosa's article, as you, some of you might have picked up, is that it's a little bit hard to even figure out exactly what he's trying to argue, right? Because he's very, very vague. And if you found it hard to understand what he did, don't feel bad, because economists for 100 years, basically, have found it really hard to understand what he was trying to say exactly. Um, and later theories have tried to clarify these things, and I don't know exactly how successfully, so let's go through some of them and see what you think. So, one theory is Williamson's theory of a firm. And this emphasized three factors that made integration attractive. So the first one was frequency. If I'm constantly buying things from you, right, then there's going to be a lot of times that I'm going to have to negotiate terms with you. And that might be really cumbersome, and so I want to actually hire you if I'm using you very often. Right? Second uh, factor was uncertainty. If it's unclear what I'm going to ask you to do for me at this point, it might not make very much sense for us to write down a contract which says exactly what you're going to do for me, because I don't even know what it is at this point. It's better for me to hire you and then just ask you to do what you want later. So a famous example of this uh, was a story that Sandy Grossman, who got his PhD here at Chicago, used to tell, which is that he was having his house built, and he wanted to make sure he didn't get ripped off. So he wrote this like 100-page contract saying, if this happens to the house, you have to pay me this much. If this happens to the house, you have to pay me this much, etc. Then eventually, the house did turn out to have a problem, and it wasn't one of the ones that he listed in the list. And so he went to a judge saying, this guy screwed up my house, won't you help me? And he said, well, you didn't write it down on the list. Uh, you know, usually I would have helped you out, right? But, uh, but you didn't write it down on the list of the things in the contract, and so clearly you didn't care about it, so I can't help you. Uh, so uh, when there's uncertainty, it often makes sense to have these more open-ended employment relationships rather than these contracts. There's also this issue of asset specificity, which I'm just going to skip, actually. Okay. So, Grossman and Hart, on the other hand, emphasize a different factor that I think can be uh, seen most clearly by thinking about why Google recently decided to build its own social network rather than just linking into Facebook more heavily, right? So, why couldn't Google have just said, look, Facebook's better than any social network we're going to make. Why don't we just make Gmail integrate really well with it and make, you know, Google Contacts integrate with it really well with it and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think the problem was that Google really wanted these integrated services to all work really well together, um, you know, connect up well between all the different things. And the problem is, imagine that Google had made a huge investment in, uh, you know, making everything link up really well with Facebook. The problem that it would face at that point is that Facebook could then say, oh, you really want to link up with us? Let's charge you a billion you know, dollars right, uh, for the right. You know, given that you've already made this huge investment in linking up with us, uh, you know, 
you, you better pay us for all the benefits you're going to get, right? More and no, right? So why couldn't Google have just said, look, Facebook's better than any social network we're going to make. Why don't we just make Gmail integrate really well with it and make, you know, Google Contacts integrate really, really well with it and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think the problem was that Google really wanted these integrated services to all work really well together. Um, you know, connect up well between all the different things. And the problem is, imagine that Google had made a huge investment in, uh, you know, making everything link up really well with Facebook. The problem that it would face at that point is that Facebook could then say, oh, you really want to link up with us? Let's charge you a billion, you know, dollars, right, uh, for the right. You know, given that you've already made this huge investment in linking up with us, uh, you know, you, you better pay us for all the benefits you're going to get, right? And knowing that, Google doesn't want to make the investment because it knows that it's going to get screwed by Apple, right, or by Facebook. Um, and, and so what uh, Grossman and Hart emphasized is it makes a lot of sense for Google to actually own the social network that it's linking up with if it's going to make these big investments because it knows it won't exploit itself, basically. It knows it won't get exploited. Yeah? Wouldn't that only work like if the firm is like a monopoly, if there's only one Facebook? But if you're like a car manufacturer and you need somebody to paint your car, and there's 50 people lining up to paint you know, like, yeah. the car for you. Well, so that, you know, that's a good point. But the key is not whether there's a monopoly ex ante, but once you've made the investment. So if I make the investment in linking up with Facebook, then Facebook's a monopolist over me, even if there are a lot of different social networks that I could link up with. Terrence? Um, most often it's done on like, both sides, for example, when you need espresso coffee machine. Yeah. yeah. But this happens on all sides. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very pervasive problem, and that's the reason why Grossman and Hart put so much emphasis on it. So there's also lots of other reasons why you might have, have things within a company. One is just physical proximity. It might be valuable you know, just to have everyone in the same building, uh, because then it's easier to monitor people, for example. Uh, corporate culture can spill over when people are actually part of the same company, right? So if you want to inspire people to serve, you know, the goals of Apple, you might want to put an Apple name on a company rather than just having some other store sell the Apple stuff. So that's one reason Apple owns its own stores, because it creates this corporate culture. Another reason is that I might want you, um, your store, to only carry Apple products. I don't want you to get distracted selling some Microsoft products and some Apple products. I want you to just focus on selling my products, right? Um, uh, it's also easier to communicate ideas within a company. So you know if I tell you an idea, you won't run off and do something that will screw over the company with it, right? You're forced to keep that idea within the company. So that's another reason you might want to be a company. So there's lots of, and actually one really important reason that my wife actually works on is that, which actually goes in the opposite direction, is you might want to hire subcontracted workers rather than having them work for the for firm because it makes it really hard to unionize. Right? Because if there's all these different workers doing all these different things from different companies, it's very hard for them to form a union across those companies. You might do it just to keep unions away. Um, so, uh, so there's all these advantages of you know being in a company or doing things outside of a company. And yet, there's lots of companies that actually look a lot more like their market <coughs> than like their companies. So I, I don't really have time to go through examples very much, but you know, Xerox is constantly spinning off uh, uh, little companies that it develops within it to be separate companies. So it doesn't really work very much like a, that arm of Xerox doesn't really work much like a company. It works more like a venture capitalist. Google has all these very different separate services that interact with one another almost like they were separate uh, companies. General Motors Acceptance Corporation is uh, one of the largest corporations in the world. And it um, was part of General Motors, but all it did was it was a bank. I mean, there was really no sense in which it was part of General Motors, except that it was making auto loans for them. Um, conglomerates with different brands, PepsiCo and so forth, have like a zillion different brands, right? And like these things might as well be separate companies in a lot of ways. Uh, and News Corporation recently is a particularly crazy example of that. They had all these British newspapers, but like nobody else in the rest of the company seemed to know what these, well, at least that's what they claimed, seemed to know what the heck that these guys were doing. So it wasn't like they were really one company. It was like they were, you know, different companies. 
uh, if you think about the government, different parts of the government act so independently of one another, right? They don't really run like one company. Um, parts of investment banks sell things to each other and actually take opposite investment positions often. Um, and there's, you know, many, many other examples uh, of companies that actually look more like they were markets. Uh, on the other hand, there's markets that look more like they were a single company. So, airline alliances. You hardly even notice when you fly abroad that, you're, that one leg of the trip was by American and one leg of the trip was by, you know, Iberia or whatever their partner is. And in fact, often you, you, you don't even notice at all because, the, you know, all the airlines are listed on the same thing. They're all co-chaired and you don't even know that you're, which airline you're on at any given moment. So that seems like they're a company, but it's done without them being part of the actual company. Uh, dedicated restaurants at the University of Chicago. You know, those are separate, but they might as well just be, you know, part of uh, UChicago. Franchises of restaurants, uh, dedicated separate suppliers. Uh, there's a gym uh, in Redmond, Washington that only serves Microsoft. It's absolutely massive, and that Microsoft basically like tells the gym what to do, but it's a separate company, right? So like, you know, in what sense, Microsoft may as well just have its own on-campus gym. Uh, if you think about the relationship between the Mac apartments and the University of Chicago, I think that's a, another good example. Labor subcontracting in Latin America. There's, there's just a zillion examples of cases where formally companies are separate, but in reality they're a lot closer than a lot of those other companies I was telling you about, which were formerly all the same company. So I think what that leads us to think about is whether the distinction between what's inside of a company and what's outside of the company really matters very much, right? Because um, it's certainly the case that if relationships within a group are close, it makes a lot of sense to have them be, you know, officially the same company. But, um, <coughs> But there's a lot of different factors that we went through that might lead you to want to make things inside the company or outside the company. And any one of the explanations we, we were talking about can almost certainly be solved by some sort of contractual relationship, as we saw in all those examples, right? Um, and so, it, I think, you know, what that leads us to is that we should really think of firms not as, like, you know, whether it's in the formal company or out of the formal company, but rather how it operates in practice. So, it will often make a lot of sense for us to divide up one legal entity called a firm into many parts and analyze them separately. Think about what their competing objectives are, right? And on the other hand, it will often make sense for us to take many separate legal firms and for the purposes of, you know, our analysis, just treat them as if they're one firm, making a coherent profit maximizing decision. Um, and so I think that what that uh, leads us to is that firms are really a sort of cluster of institutions, of people, of assets, which may or may not be legally the same company, but which operate in a pre relatively coherent manner, and that we can think of as maximizing their profits together. So that's it for the lecture, and I left three minutes at the end to answer all your questions. So who had questions? Anyone have questions? Yeah. Um, so about the consensus part that you mentioned before, basically, is yeah. what you were saying, like, at top levels, generally our incentives work quite well, and then at lower levels, it's often consensus, because the top level people tend to have greater effects on stuff like stock rights and stuff. I mean, I, I think it's a mix. I mean, I, I wouldn't generalize that way necessarily. I think you're probably right that that is basically some role, but what really matters is how measurable things are. You know, because sometimes the low levels, things can be very measurable. Like, for example, at a lot of call centers, you can measure exactly how satisfied the customers were as you get them to take all the service. You can measure everything. And then hard incentives work really great there. Whereas the manager of the whole call center thing might have all sorts of weird things he can be doing, deciding whether he's going to build a factory somewhere, etc. But I think the key thing is measurability versus non-measurability, not the level of seniority. But it might be correlated with the level of seniority. Yeah? Um, I have a question about uh, Yeah. Like, were managers, or were we talking about um, like managers, like low-level managers, or like higher-level managers, or like managers in general? 
it, as I said, it's turtles all the way down. So almost everything that I said uh, applies, I think, to all levels, except the financing part that I was talking about is usually going to apply to the highest level managers, right? But, the, but that's just an example of the broader incentive problems that we went through, which I think apply at all levels of management. I mean, leadership is going to usually be more effective to influence lower level people, right? Uh, and these harder incentives are usually going to be used more often for higher level people.